it gives me huge pleasure to welcome Martha Rosler to the stage, who has been a personal inspiration, but an inspiration for many people across five decades of making work um, as an artist, but also as a thinker and a theorist. <laughs> she's, she's disputing the amount of time I've, I've, I've said that she's been here. Martha, you can come up on stage and tell us the truth about how many decades you've been making extraordinary work. Martha Rosler is an international artist. She has been represented in so many important um, major shows of her own and group shows, major international biennales. She is very present across the world. <laughs> Um, she's, she's working as well as we speak, making work. Um, Martha makes photographs, videos, sorry, um, installations. She also writes. Her work is multidisciplinary. And um, importantly for our symposium today and tomorrow, um, I think for us in organizing this, we found in Martha's work a profound engagement with the relationship between making images of housing directly political images of housing and understanding the way in which housing belongs to a broader sense of developing sociality and also of, of realizing its lack within contemporary society. Martha? Well, hi. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, I the, uh, those seven decades I've been working. <laughs> I'm a totally inconsistent producer of work. There's this problem of knowing how to present myself coherently. Um, so, as usual, I have far too many images, but the powers that be are punishing me by making everything look like total crap on the projection. So, um, <laughs> let's get going. Am I going to really be stuck with those lights in my eyes? <laughs> All right, um, so I'm going to wander through more subjects and images than you want to think about, but I thought I would start with this. Um, by the way, the background on my screen is great. Really, could you cut the key lights just a little bit more? Seriously, you're killing me. Um, that means you, Mr. Lighting Person. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm not sure this needs anything further to say except that this is currently up in Berlin and it's a banner on uh, a, uh, a building front in uh, Aha, Auguststrasse. Uh, God, this is ridiculous. You know I can't see my screen. So. All right, I'm wasting too much time. I thought that I would go through a number of different ways in which I've talked about social life, habitation, uh, modes of, of being together and in various media, including some of uh, the work that you already know, some of you. This is available on YouTube and Web, at least the one on the left, and it was restaged as an audition with 26 women at the White Chapel. It says 2004, but it was 2003. So it's a video about the relationship of the female gender, if I can call it that, and uh, uh, modern life and homes and so on, it's obvious. This is about dispossession. It's a series of uh, one minute public service announcements for broadcast television in Seattle about Native Americans uh, with the interviews with Native Americans. So um, this is an entirely different issue, which is else's class. Oh. <laughs> um, the garage sale as a, oh great, much better, a communal act uh, and uh, the building of a community that recognizes itself through the exchange of commodity, uh, which I found extremely peculiar when I moved to the real U.S. from New York City. And, um, Sorry, 
this has a bright pink background, so on the screen here. Uh, so this is where uh, these garage sales have been held. And one thing I would like to say about the garage sale is an art form that is staged in an art venues is that at first it was dis uh, dismissed and uh, treated with dismay. In fact, uh, Peter, no, I mean, uh, Herbert Marcuse, where I was a student, uh, the first one said that it was a profanation of the art space and so on. But along about 1999, art institutions became really hot to have them in, in, in their spaces to the point where after Art Basel, the next one will be in the atrium of the Museum of Modern Art in New York in about a year. So shopping, yeah. For something completely different, there's a work called The Bowery, which is also about locale, location, and who is assigned what kind of space where. But this work was made, unlike a lot of my work at the time, which was done to be extra institutional, male work, and so on, and, and often without images, but only texts. Uh, this one was meant to hang in museums and to address the subject of the documentary image of those who can't escape the camera and how that plays in terms of uh, disciplinary uh, uh, practices in society in general. Uh, so it's called, as it says, the Bowery to Inadequate Descriptive Systems, and if anything, it privileges the text uh, over the image, which is of a walk down Skid Row, the quintessential Skid Row in New York City, uh, which now, of course, has been totally gentrified. Uh, so this is just uh, some of the images I like to say when I'm forced to talk about it, that the thin strip between the storefront and the street is the space allocated to those who have no homes. Suitably in their own little graves. Okay, so the, the way I collected the uh, language, which uh, unlike the images and presuppositions I saw as kind of general, a, a, a kind of shared poetry between all groups and classes about the states of intoxication, and I simply went around and I asked people for words for drunkenness, and I also looked up dictionaries of slang because I wanted to historical element as well. I, looked, I used uh, elements of English, outdated English slang as well, to make that point. So there are both nouns and adjectives. Um, and now for something totally present. Um, this is something that's now underway. This is about Brooklyn, New York, a section called Greenpoint. Um, the spillover from Williamsburg, <laughs> and um, I was, for various reasons related to the curatorial insistence, the project, uh, I did what I normally don't do, which is I stuck camera in people's faces after saying, um, here's what I'm doing, would you like to be in this work? which I'll explain a little bit about. Uh, and uh, I, I know most of these people because I've lived in this neighborhood for 26 years. But the idea was uh, supposed to be based on Walker Evans's uh, follow-up to his uh, New American photographs and also the Farm Security Administration photographs, which was a baseline government uh, project during the Depression era of the 1930s to not only argue to urban magazine buying audiences that they should care about the rural poor, but also to build a picture of the United States as an entity which basically didn't exist. It was a series of states. It was an area of states and regions and uh, was a main effort of the Roosevelt administration, which has been under siege by the right-wing Republicans in particular ever since. That is that the United States is, as it says, one nation under God. Uh, 
leave that part out. Okay, so here's part of the text which uh, uh, sort of explains to the audience what we're doing here in this project. It's one of the oldest neighborhoods in Brooklyn, as it says. It's right above Williamsburg, which is why it's being, uh, the main reason why it's being gentrified. Uh, but I try to talk about who are the immigrants, and as you saw here, this is a man from Naples, a man from India, and he didn't say which city, even though I asked him five times, and a woman from Rockcliffe, I guess. Is that where she's from? Or, uh, Reschow, I can't pronounce Polish, I'm really sorry, I apologize. Uh, and uh, so I couldn't do this project without a text like this on the wall, but still. So um, it's mixing. Most of the people who were willing to be photographed owned their own businesses. The employees refused, and I included that as well. But um, like the man at the bottom, he's not there, just the storefront. Um, and it is about different flows and migrations and residents. These are, of course, hipsters. Um, and, uh, hey, you know. Who, that question that said artists are complicit? Well, you know, there's a long, 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 long discussion there. Yes. <coughs> artists are, of course, the army of gentrifiers, more particularly, uh, as I hope most urban planners uh, you know, certainly in the Netherlands, uh, since Richard Florida sold the idea of Bohemia, uh, which really doesn't mean artists at all. Uh, his creative class doesn't mean artists at all, but it's a nice cover and uh, produces good uh, uh, Well, these employees wanted to be photographed because they're young. No young people said no to me. Um, but, well, that's the way it is. The police. And some of the changing face. This is the slide I was having trouble with when we started, so uh, when we were fiddling around, so I apologize. Um, I won't try to fix it. Okay, so this, in other words, for new American photographs, which the show at the Wattis in San Francisco is supposed to be about looking at changes in the face of poverty and uh, prosperity in depression circumstances, I chose a neighborhood in transition. Uh, not to talk about, oh, look at it, look at it, look at the poor people, which of course is what the Bowery is exactly taking on as an issue, but rather to talk about social process and flows of people, which is one of the things I'm particularly interested in. Um, I'm going to move back to February of this year and talk about an entirely different kind of project at the Singapore Biennale, which not only is a group project, which I do sometime, sometimes, but also is about the creation of an imaginary community among communities um, through an act of collective consultation and construction. It was a project in which I solicited and enlisted the help of primarily women in Singapore, many of whom were artists, but not all of whom were artists, which I'll say a little bit more about in a minute, to think about making a garden at the old airport um, as part of the Biennale. Um, and uh, I was gonna say that, but I'll get to it. anyway, so this was the piece of land that I was. I wanted to do it at Changi Airport because, as I said, I'm really interested in the flows of people. And why was I working primarily with women? Because I have a, a friend in Australia who's from Singapore, and I said, so what kind of thing is needed? Oh. Um, she said, women have no place to get together in public, really. So I thought, well, this will be another form of becoming public. Uh, and of course, men participated as well. Uh, so they, they said, yeah, well, you can't. Changi, no, not a chance. 
you're not getting anywhere near Changi, but we have this old airport, you can work there, and in fact it was a, a biennial site. So these are, we had many meetings, and uh, something I wanted to say about these pictures is, this is the man from National Parks, uh, and this is the contractor, the woman holding the, uh, the coconut. Uh, and next to her is her subcontracted employee. <laughs> Singapore, which is a country invented by one guy, Lee Kuan Yew, is the epitome of neoliberalism, and in fact, the government essentially does nothing. All services are contracted out, and in particular in Singapore, they're contracted out to migrants who have no rights of any kind whatsoever, whether housing or habitation, or even time off. And so everything that gets done there gets done through the, the work of migrants. Um, so eventually, these are the participants. The, the theme of the Singapore Biennale of this year was uh, open house, which is why I did it this way. And there's the uh, landscape and project assistance prints. I had to hire them. I had to get a budget and actually directly pay princes to do this. So. Uh, this is a bad slide, but at the top, bad image, sorry, it's pixelated, is the guys from Princes who are working on one small corner of the garden. The image at the lower left is uh, maids, that is, domestic workers who are migrants. These are the fortunate ones uh, in the sense that they have a day off because many domestic workers have no time off whatsoever. They're not allowed to go out. Thing. I'm trying to censor myself about Singapore, which is always touted as, you know, the ideal place. By the way, of course, Lee Kuan Yew is known as um, the master gardener and Singapore as the garden city, garden island. So everybody who I invited understood that this was also a metaphoric issue here. Um, and. Um, the Nature Society also participated partly, uh, I guess I removed most of the images of their, uh, their signs because they were a little hard to read, because what gardening means in this context is the removal of everything that might be wild or indigenous or self-motivated and its replacement by selected and chosen domesticated people and uh, plants and so on. Uh, one of the projects of the Nature Society was a map of Singapore, it's somewhere in the middle there, with all the place names named for trees, with the trees actually placed there as a kind of return of the real. Um, okay, so then I have to talk about this. And actually, talking about this project terrifies me because it means that I have to talk endlessly or insufficiently snow you with a blizzard of images, but. Uh, this is a project from 1989. I was invited to do uh, an exhibition at the DIA Art Foundation, and I said I wanted to do it on homelessness, and they said, fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, then I realized um, that it was idiotic and insane for me to produce a body of work on something that everywhere in but in New York City, artists were also already addressing. Because in New York, you can't do this kind of thing, but certainly uh, artists who are not under the, the gun of the market uh, at that point, because things have somewhat changed, which is another conversation, um, certainly had done many actions and, and works. And so it turned out that a lot of artists in New York, they just didn't have a place to show them that was particularly visible, but okay, so I thought I can't do a show on homelessness because this is the liberal pity party solution. Um, so I will do a show on homelessness, housing, and the built environment, but wait a minute, if it's all one show, people will not get the point. So it has to be three shows. So that's what it was, and I called it If You Lived Here because of a real estate sign I'd seen when I was a kid that I found completely mysterious 
driving down uh, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway in my parents' car uh, on Left Rack City of all horrendous um, non-social housing projects. There was a sign that said on one building, if you lived here, you'd be home now. And my only thought was, why would anyone want to live here alongside this highway? But seriously, it stuck in my mind. It turns out this is a widespread, this is Boston, widely used slogan. So um, I, I thought it was interesting because of the various propositions that every word suggested in if you lived here. And this was one of the negative incentives, which is classically uh, a, a competition for among uh, architecture students to produce precarious housing <laughs> for poor people. And this was just so appalling to me that I thought, yes, uh, I'd like this a shelter with clear plastic flaps that allow the tent dweller to watch for danger in the form of the police. Um, so this is uh, what the state of New York was in at that point, which is uh, all kinds. New York was barely out of its fiscal crisis, which of course was yet another banking crisis. And uh, the city, desperate to uh, hide the South Bronx's worst uh, ruins from freeway goers, put up these aluminum windows, which I'm not sure you can see, but they have pictures of cats and flower potted plants and stuff. So this is some of my plans for invoking artists, video makers, film photographers, architects and planners, uh, and a series of individuals. And also, um, actually, I wound up working with acti activist groups which I'll get to in a minute, I hope. But anyway, there was a, a lot of uh, films and videos that um, it's really hard to talk about, uh, especially because in taking the photographs of the exhibition, Dia removed the television sets that were in the middle of the gallery because television is ugly. So I've had to Photoshop them back in, the pictures that I took. I put into their pictures, but I'll show you that in a minute. But anyway, so this is just rented films, but there were videos playing constantly. Um, this is uh, the one on the lower left. They had taken that TV away, and there'll be another one. So these are a couple of the shows. Uh, I also use what the waste real estate of the gallery. It may be normal to have graphs now, but you didn't really ever show graphs in, in uh, a gallery exhibition before at that point. So, um, and these are barely readable, I'm sorry. Actually, Laura, where are you? We did better than I, we did, it's not too bad, yeah. <laughs> you should have seen it before. Oh, and advertisements um, were up there also for high-rise high living where even the weather is different, and of course it's sold through ads. It actually says that. Um, okay, so on that TV, yeah, it was gone. And here's why it's so terrifying to talk about. You can see some of the ads in the upper area. I can't really take the time to explain these projects, so I apologize, you guys who made the work, Okay, but I did want to say about Susan Annick Brown's work here that it's a work about a building in Harlem through documents from the minute that it w the ground was broken till it, the tenants were forced out for gentrification. Um, hmm, stop talking to me. Um, and she actually talked about the denial of city services uh, in what the city was calling at that time planned shrinkage, which is a wonderful term for getting rid of people. Uh, so she stepped outside the, the bounds of the house itself to talk about uh, various pronouncements of, uh, in the neighborhood. And uh, this, what, I worked with Dan Wiley. He was a student I met when I was teaching in the Whitney program. Uh, this is moving itself along. Uh, and he had all kinds of ties to the activist community. So uh, 
I had free entree, thanks to Dan, who is now the representative for my local congressperson, uh, to work with activist groups whom we also invited to participate. And this is, this is his map of Manhattan, talking about subsidies. This is an activist group that was being evicted for not paying their electric bill, and they did a document search to find out who actually owned their building, and it was the electric company, of course. Um, Chinatown History Project, uh, something about the, uh, the Guggen Guggenheim Museum, South, the South Bronx, uh, a painting about precarity, and inside the reading room, this was another thing that was really important, was to have a reading room. It had books, it had flyers, and it had posters, so you could read at whatever level you wanted and take things away. And of course, there were also artworks. And this is actually about a squat in the middle of Manhattan, in Manhattan Valley, that old poster. Uh, so I was trying to bring some history in as well because very few people know that anything in Manhattan was ever squatted above the Lower East Side. Um, I'm just going to rush through these and hope that you have the goodwill to let me get away with doing that. So this is the second show. And this is, I worked with two groups. One was Homeward Bound Community Services, self-named. They organized themselves and sat on the park right in front, in the park right in front of, the, of City Hall for over 100 days, at which point their belongings were seized and thrown in trash bags. And, but at that point, the city actually couldn't get away with that exactly. They came back, they got thrown out again, and then they housed themselves in a church basement and organized. And this was the summer before the show, and I said, okay, um, would you guys like to participate? And they said, sure, we'll, we'll participate. I asked, what would you like? And they said, an office in the gallery. No problem. They also uh, were on the panels that we organized. There were four town meetings. And um, they organized workshops as well. Uh, this is them in City Hall Park. They registered people to vote. Uh, that's City Hall at the back. And, oh yeah, each of the shows had a slogan. The first one was, if you can't afford to live here, move, which was by Mayor Koch. This one is Peter Marcuse. Homelessness exists not because the housing system is not working, but because this is the way it works. If you're wondering why I'm pulling my nose, it's because I'm kind of sick, sorry. Um, which actually is very close to one of the uh, Ben Ehrenreich quotes. Yeah. So this is their office. This is a hideous slide of them, some of them, and friends at the office. Uh, I'm, okay. And the other group that I worked with is the Madhousers, which is, as it says, a group of architects and designers who did something very similar to the Tenth City in that they built organized housing, they treated the people as their clients, and they uh, helped get them into the social service network. Um, so uh, I asked them, would you like to participate? And they said, no. Um, why? Because we are based in Atlanta and we don't know anyone up there. So I invited them to come up and live in Dia's dirt room uh, and to meet the context that we had in the activist community. And so they built three huts in New York. This is their website now. They still exist. This is one of the pages. So if you'd like to look them up, madhousers.org. Uh, they built three. This one was on 8th Street in Manhattan for a particular woman who had been evicted. The city went crazy and, of course, bulldozed it in, in a day. Uh, but not before the press got hold of it. And, of course, and this is the Brooklyn uh, one, which actually stayed up for six years. But, of course, we didn't say to the press, this is an art project, because essentially it wasn't. So we didn't, we just facilitated the contact. And uh, 
let it move forward, right? So this is uh, the two groups working together. Sorry about this. Uh, it's on auto somehow, and I don't want to take the time to mess with it. Uh, there were a lot of different photographic projects. Let me mention that the tent city that you see there is on Canal Street, for those who know Manhattan, just as you exit the Manhattan Bridge. And the reason they're so low, it may be hard to see, is because the police said, OK, we're not going to remove you, but it, you can't be higher than the bridge railing. And so it was this high. Um, Both Andrew Byard and Sinan are homeless uh, artists. These are street posters. This is done as a collaborative work by the Third Street men of the Third Street Men's Shelter, which is now the neighbor of the new museum. Um, this is the only image of a person lying on the street, and it's in a satirical project by Robbie Canal and his students at Otis in LA because there is no official housing project for the homeless. There are only bus benches. So they made a series of bus bench posters, of which that's one. Uh, Krzysztof Vodichko's Homeless Vehicle Project, again, uh, a work by Greg Shillette, uh interrogating an image of a homeless woman, f by a photograph by Jacob Reese. This is the reading room as shelter with works by squatter artists and New York City school children. Squatter artists work. Street poster, um, part of the, I just wanted to show you this. I, as I said, didn't want pictures of people lying on the street, so I had uh, a manifesto by a photographer, a friend of mine, on why it's important to take pictures of people sleeping on the street. So uh, this is Homeward Bound using the shelter and the gallery for meetings and receptions. This is the third show, which is more about urban visions. And I can't talk too much about them. This is, uh, there's actually some Dutch social housing projects in here, but it's both infill housing and also housing the social. Uh, this was the. <laughs> Very, once again, very popular slogan, Sous uh, les pavé le plage, uh, which is, of course, about unlocking the imagination under a society of machine death situationist, May 68, uh, with various projects. This is, again, the project on uh, how to build the social. Woo! The, uh, there were phantom transitions I tried to get rid of them. <laughs> I hate PowerPoint, <laughs> just the worst. OK, so this project <clears throat> is, a, is a, an interesting project about making visible. There were little uh, casitas, or little houses on vacant lots in the five boroughs in New York uh, during the fiscal crisis. And subsequently, and the city was going to come in and knock them down. And a group of uh, photographers and folklorists and other academic types and, and uh, Betty Sue Hertz, who's an artist and curator, got together and studied it. They made it an object of study, bringing it into a certain respectable register of visibility, and so the city couldn't knock them down. Of course, as we've seen, not every city takes that route, but there's a difference between a tent and a hut, maybe. So this is Rincon Criojo in 2008. Uh, in the New York Times. And you can see it has the full faith and credit of the New York Times uh, here, complete with chickens and drummers. Um, this, I will only say, is a project in uh, London, Ontario, a woman whose family owned a uh, uh, single room occupancy hotel and in which artists, I'm going backwards, uh, in which art <laughs> artists did rooms for the residents. And um, I'll just get to this in a minute. Several different plans for housing homeless mothers and children, none of which, needless to say, got bought. One of my favorites, it's totally invisible, Hanging Gardens for Times Square, uh, a project on the corporate 
Atrium Garden by Dan Graham and Robin Hurst, Docklands Community Poster Project from uh, Docklands in England, and a project on a Foucauldian project actually on rich and poor in uh, Caracas, which I won't talk about. It's easier to talk about the Docklands who uh, have done many actions, including uh, posters in the city. Boy, this is really running fast. That's fine. I can talk faster than it. Um, bus posters uh, on women and homelessness that were, of course, staged. Oh, uh, I had a few others to show you, but you can see a couple in the corner there. A project by uh, Camila Jose Vergara, Vergara and uh, I'm going to get back to that. Kenneth Jackson, the urbanist, about the ways that cities fail, essentially, the ways that uh, impoverishment causes <coughs> decay and the way residents fight back. And um, they're basically case studies in what not to do. Yeah, I've got five more minutes. How fast can I go? So this is a project that I did in Times Square, it's housing is a human right. And uh, what I want to say about this is that um, at the time, the public art fund saw itself as something related to the public, which meant that we were offered the Spectacolor sign for messages to the public. Of course, now public art means spectacle uh, in the US. So uh, you can have underwear models on a, uh, an aircraft carrier in the Hudson. That's literally true. Okay, so, and of course, this is Times Square now. No hanging gardens. Um, okay, um, I'm going to run through this, and I'm going to take more than five minutes. So uh, I was asked to show... Uh, on the 20th anniversary, I was asked to show uh, the archive, and I said, well, the archive, papers? And they said, yes, this is very important. All right, so it was in the basement gallery of uh, Eflux, and uh, yeah, people were looking at the, um, the archives and the documents. But, you know, I'd never do a show about homelessness from 1989 without having current symposia and uh, uh, material. Um, and then the show traveled, and meanwhile I thought, wait a minute, I have lots of visual stuff. So the, the character changed when it came to Costco, and there were a lot of the original materials that was too big to be put on tables, and also, oh God, I'm sorry, this is so unreadable. Um, um, visual stuff on the wall and um, a contemporary, a wall of current issues and a uh, panel discussion, upper left and the audience, about contemporary issues in and around Utrecht. And then La Verena, I bet I spelled that wrong, uh, in Barcelona. And the local projects were uh, in a separate room. These are all local projects. And we had a two-day uh, conference in which uh, activists talked about the problematics of trying to organize in a, city that, in a city that pretends that it solved the problem of gentrification and so on. Very interesting. Uh, I'm going to run through these quickly in two seconds because I want to talk about a more private vision. This, I just want to say about this, I've been very interested not only in the idea of women as household appurtenances, but also, uh, and this is about, these, this is work about representation, but also in the invisibility of women's labor. And in this particular image, there are two forms of invisible labor, which is the men uh, hoisting the containers, which most people who talk about this image never mention. So invisibility, this is also about a kind of invisibility of labor. It's about, uh, about Vogue magazine, but it's also about the production of the clothes in Vogue. It's 
from 1981. And then I realized, because the montages are from the 60s, that actually we had a bigger problem than just the household economies in the US, but also the way in which we establish who has the right to be vacuuming those damn curtains and who has the right to be lying dead outside the window and, and other issues relating to the production of, uh, of an aggressive neo-imperialist state. So I'll go quickly through these. You know, they look a hell of a lot better than you. <laughs> but this is how they were actually disseminated as uh, newspaper and flyer images, not in glossy uh, form. And this is just where this image came from. And then I was asked to participate in a show called Election in 2004 to try and get rid of George Bush. And uh, I thought, uh, well, I participated in a group I helped found, uh, though not as an active enough member, called Artists Against the War. And I thought, I really have to do something as an individual. And I thought the stupidest thing I could do would be to go back to those montages from the Vietnam War and say, you know what? We're still there. So if you think I'm being an idiot for reinstituting something that I haven't done in 30 years, too bad. And this is George and Jeb Bush, and uh, one of the signature uh, image, uh, injuries of the war, which is traumatic uh, limb amputation. And this, of course, is an uh, Abu Ghraib image. And it actually has a little thing in there about election, because the show was called Election. And I'll just run through a few of these. Oh, God, <laughs> it doesn't look like that. But once again, it's, uh, it hardly needs explaining what is the subject here. These are two different ones. And then in 2008, I was asked to put a work on the cover of Modern Painters. And I thought, I better make a new one, because I don't want to recycle the old one. So I said, OK, send me your dimensions. And this is uh, the work. And people said, oh, you have all these models in this current series, all these women. What do you have against models? And I said, oh, too many women models? Maybe. Uh, and then there was this, which, uh, yes, is a voting poster. And I will take three minutes just to talk. I mean it. Uh, just to talk about some photographs. Honest folks, they look a lot better than on screen, but this is a, um, you know, a person with a camera traveling all the time. I won't talk about why I started, but it does have to do with being an itinerant artist. So actually, the second series, which is uh, airports, came first. Um, and I'm only showing a couple of, because I used to drive to work also, only a couple of the road photos. That's my neighborhood, Greenpoint, before. Um, and I'll just show some of the airport images. And this one is a signal image in a sense, because it points to the fact that the system of air travel conceives of itself and sells itself to you as a world apart. Um, do that in a minute. This was before, at the dawn, uh, when air travel was conceived as a utopian bridge to another universe. Uh, and this is more the present. Now, when you get off a plane in most places, it doesn't matter the country, the jetways all advertise banks. That's because the flow of capital is the underlying figure here. And this is an ad for the Wall Street Journal from the 1980s in the sub-basement of O'Hare, the US's busiest airport. But it's also what the system of air travel is about, which is the replacement of your actual experience in flying and waiting and rushing and suppressing that ever-present fear of death with a series of uh, different experiences, which I won't talk about. OK, so there's this promise as well, which is that you can get as far away as you like, but don't worry, we're chasing you. Um, and this is the way the thing usually looks. 
there's uh, a number of texts counting down now, and it's, oh, the computer is also telling me that I'm not connected. Fate conspires against me. So these are the texts, um, and perfectly the slash through the word only has disappeared, that's great. Uh, and this is along the lower uh, edge of the, f the wall on which the photographs appear are these other ways of, uh, by which we organize and know space. And I'll just, okay, again, this is about uh, two forms of invisible labor, one, the what is called immaterial labor or cognit cognitive labor, but also the man cleaning the displays behind these people at the Frankfurt airport, um, working for the man there. Uh, and of course, the obvious, and the backstory. And uh, these will be the last four or five images. This is the subway, which uh, is what flying felt to me like, like the underground or the metro, um, you're in this metal tube, and all sensory inputs have been replaced by other ones. Um, but uh, there's a f prohibition among photographers never to pick, take pictures in subways, because this is what amateurs do. I love it. <sighs> and of course, if flying is the global there's nothing more inherently local than the working class on the subway, which is really the issue here. And I'll end with this issue, this image of the ultimate itinerant worker who can be found anywhere, which is the player of the panpipes who represents that particular combination of creative class and uh, itinerant precarity. Thank you. Let me ask a question. Nothing Is there some, something? Somebody here? Yes. Can we have a microphone here, please? Oh, could I ask you to stand up? There's a right. technical stand reason. Up. Thank yeah. you. Hi, I'm Christoph um, from Hamburg. Uh, I, I, I think it, uh, you, took a, you pretended not to make a theoretical talk, but I saw that uh, I think there is uh, this line uh, that starts with a really important uh, gentrification critical exhibition series in the DR Art Foundation, and which ended actually with the, uh, with the person that is working in the city. And I think this marks a real big difference at the moment, which is also, I think, a question behind your tent city question, because it's so much connected to work at the beginning, and um, uh, then with homelessness and the crisis, uh, uh, and, and, and for district solutions and so on, and suddenly now, at the moment when Occupy comes in, Occupy Wall Street, you have people who work, who are Facebook people, who are, you know, there's kind of, there's suddenly a new connection. And I think I would very much like if you could probably say something more about this kind of complex between Richard Florida's creative class, art, uh, working precariously, and uh, the city as a place of production, maybe. Just give you, first of all, this is a subject larger than me or my small ability to stand here and answer it. If, for those who like reading online, there's a, I did a three part essay last year on, called Culture, Culture Class based on an invitation to look at the work of Richard Florida, which actually occurred in the Netherlands at Den Bosch, uh, thanks to the Hermes Foundation. But uh, I will sum up a paper I gave a couple of weeks ago at a wonderful conference in Warsaw where I talk about the occupation movement as, in a sense, the revenge of the creative class, that is, middle class people acting badly. And uh, the tagline of my talk, which of course is a little less jocular than I'm being right now, is Florida says gentrify, we say occupy. Mm -hmm. Because an occupation, of course, is something wildly and entirely different. Is that enough?
Okay. <laughs> Someone else? Any other questions? While you're thinking, uh, is that, no? Um, Martha, I wanted to ask you, uh, at one point you talked about, it was, in the, it was in one of the exhibitions in the If You Lived Here series, I can't remember which one, uh, you were working with um, a, 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 a group of um, builders. It was, what was the name of the? Oh, 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 mad, the Mad Houses, the Mad Houses. Thank you. And um, you, you said um, that you didn't, when, when the Mad Houses were placed, there was one in Detroit that lasted for a long, no, there was. They were all in Manhattan. They were all in Manhattan. They were normally, but uh, no, not only in Manhattan, sorry, Manhattan and Brooklyn. Right. And, uh, some, one of them lasted for quite a long time, the other one got destroyed immediately. You said, I didn't want, I. Okay. Um, did y you said very? You said I, when they were put out there, we didn't call them um, uh, art projects. Obviously, partly because they weren't art projects; they were built by the mad houses that aren't artists. They belong to a different activist tradition. Um, for you, how important is that strategy of sometimes declaring it as a Martha Rosler project and sometimes just letting it be? I mean. Do, do, you, do you have a kind of policy around that, or does this, is it something that you decide on the... What are the politics of that decision for you? It's ad hoc. Okay. It's completely ad hoc. Sometimes it makes sense to claim the work as by a particular person. With the Pull Up the Pigs, uh, it, there was a problem because I had a collaborator, my son Josh Neufeld, the graphic novelist, and I felt that it was unfair to leave his name off. On the other hand, we needed to be seen as collaborators, and also um, it was going to look too much like an unsigned uh, propaganda poster without it being claimed as stemming from a source that doesn't always make that kind of pronouncement. So in that case, it was strategically to claim both, uh, well, to claim that there was an a pair of artists behind it for a very particular reason, which has to do again with, with artists in public and the way that artists, particularly in billboard projects, are often now commandeered not to produce messages, but rather to produce some kind of shock and awe, something, you know, that is supposed to punch a hole in the everyday life of people, such as in LA, where the billboard that Josh and I did had to do with the the contrast of funding for uh, university education versus jails, for all education. Uh, and we were competing right down the block with the diesel posters in giant letters that said, be stupid, which... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, one at the back, last question. Could you stand up and tell us who you are? Yeah, hi, I, I, I'm Nick from London. Um, I was kind of interested in your, your Singapore project, uh, the work that you did, uh, which was to kind of give public space within which women could, could work. I kind of got two questions in, in relation to that. The first was uh, about um, how long it was used uh, uh, in the context of uh, the Biennale. And the, the second kind of relates to uh, what Andrea was asking, which was the kind of the role of artists within the space of capitalism rather than without it. Uh, would, would, would that be a kind of response to, um, uh, to, to that question of Andreas of how an artist can kind of operate within, but given that the Biennale is uh, an economically as well as culturally driven uh, gesture? Well, that's a, a, a nuanced and difficult question to try and address. I also gave the keynote at the Singapore Biennale and my topic was exactly the contrast of the local and social in this great ship of fools that sails from port to port that we call the Biennale. And I also contrasted it to fairs and blockbuster exhibitions and the way that Biennales produce a certain kind of international conversation for the place that cites it, which um, I'm underselling a bit here, but uh, it's very difficult to claim that artists ever, well, isn't this a 
debate we've had for at least 20 years, which is, is there an outside? So we're always operating within capitalism, all the more so now as there are hardly any other spaces. But, you know, there's a certain invagination of spaces that, uh, in which we claim as our own an imaginary space outside, which is a project also that I did at Utopia Station with my students at the Venice Biennale of 2003. There was another part to your question that I wanted to address. Uh, just how long was it? Oh, yeah, yeah, important. So I can't remember now whether the Biennale was two months or three months. I think it was three. The people who planted things that were edible continuously harvested them, particularly the migrants whose garden was actually an herbal garden uh, by their choice. And all the, the since the Nature Society was uh, one of the participants, we made sure that all the plants at the end were relocated to whoever wanted them, and the trees went back to the um, National Park's nursery uh, so that nothing was abandoned because even though it rains every damn day, you can't assume that that condition is enough to keep the plants in, in good shape. So um, it was not a permanent installation, and the question from the beginning that I had was, what's happening to the site? And the answer was, oh, probably a hotel. <laughs> it's a beautiful little modernist airport. It was used ironically by the People's Association for the intervening years as a back office. The People's Association is this, one of these bogus, but also real um, political organizations on the ground set up by Lee Kuan Yew's party. So I said it's, the politics of Singapore are really complicated and I feel very precarious standing here and pretending to know what I'm talking about. So. There was a question here that I'd like to give yeah. one second to. One. <laughs> Sorry, one last question, Tati sure. Krieger from SCORE Amsterdam. Um, since we have the luxury of having you as an artist speaking today and picking up on what Nick said, I also want to pick up on a remark you sort of quickly made when you addressed that work you had on the Times Square. And you said, well, that was when Public Art Fund was doing you know, real sort of artworks in the public realm rather than spectacles. Now, to me, that was a very interesting remark because we live in this sphere where, you know, people view arts and visual arts, whether it's inside or outside the white cube, as something that needs to be a blockbuster or at least create, you know, reach many publics. And to have your view on what should art, and it's actually an underlying question of this symposium series AAA, what is the role that art can fulfill in the public realm? I will give you more than three minutes. Oh, I don't need the... No, but I won't. <laughs> I'm not in the business of shoulds. I really have to say that. And also, I'm not that bad as a diagnostician, but not so great as uh, a predictor or proposer's uh, of alternatives because other people are often so very much better at developing alternative forms than I. Um, what I think one of the many things that art can do is to obviously create symbolic activity around something that is uh, in everybody's mind, sort of, or at the back of other things in their mind that is um, fugitive and ephemeral, and to condense it into, as I said, symbolic activity, whether a visual or an activity, and to thereby create a different space for thinking. So um, that's a primitive answer, but it's the best that I can do. Thank you. Thank you so much for your patience. Martha, thank you very much.